Uh, we're going to start right away with Adam Jorgensen. Yep. He's going to tell us a little bit about distributed computing in Python. Hi all. Um, welcome to my second proper PyCon talk ever. Uh, I've done a bunch of lightning talks, but this is the f second real one. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be discussing uh, Celery and Crossbar, which are two Python kind of frameworks, toolkits for doing asynchronous disputed distributed application programming. So I work at a company called Recommed. We do an online booking system um, in the medical space. We also provide an API for um, software integrators to you know, integrate with our online platform with. Obviously, software integrators not working in the online space. Our tech stack is pretty diverse, as you can see. Um, but I think that's pretty normal for most people working in the web space in 2016. You know, things have moved on a lot since 10 years ago. And you know, if you want to keep up with the pace, you've kind of got to yeah, add stuff to the stack. So distributed computing is a very wide area, um, as I'm sure you're all aware. It's everything from distributed storage to distributed processing and uh, variations on the same theme. Um, and if we look at the Python wiki entry on this, one of the Python wiki entries on this, that is, the one of the other ones is almost empty. This one, you can see that there are a lot of tools that Python provides for doing this. Um, and if you can actually train your binoculars, you'll even see Celery's up there at the top. And yep, that page wasn't even the first one. There's more. Um, and as with any good wiki, um, a lot of these projects no longer exist. They're dead. They've merged into other projects. Or they're just not included. So crossbar is in the missing in action category. So yeah, uh, rather than trying and failing to talk about everything in the space, I'm just going to deal with two things that I have some experience with. Um, Celery, which we actually use actively at Recommend at the moment, and have been doing so for pretty much two and a half years. And Crossbar, which we're looking into trialing a little bit to implement some features that we think would be really cool to have in our system. So I'll start with Celery. It's the older of the two projects. Um, it describes itself as a distributed task queue. That's maybe a little bit inaccurate since the queue part of this, the equation is going to be provided by a third-party broker. Um, the recommended options in that space are RabbitMQ and Redis. There are a lot of other options supported, but they're going to be going away in the next version of Celery, so you should probably not worry about them anyway. So a Celery application consists of tasks, uh, which you define quite simply. It's just standard Python functions. You decorate them in a specific fashion, and that marks them as you know, being available for asynchronous execution. You can execute tasks synchronously in your local process, or you can execute them asynchronously with a Celery worker by obviously using one of the various methods available. Now, obviously, the fact that you can call the task synchronously and asynchronously means that often you're going to be deploying Celery as part of another application system, one which is synchronous. So a, a common use case is part of a Django application to add asynchronous functionality to it. Uh, in those cases, you know, sometimes you might actually make use of the synchronous call, but you're probably not going to. Um, that might be more something that you'll use inside um, when the task is being called from within a Siri worker. You might call out to another task because obviously when you're inside a work process, you need to make some decisions about whether or not you want to execute a function which is also a task, whether or not you want to ex execute it in a delayed fashion or immediately, so on. So yeah, a Celery deployment um, generally consists of at least one worker process. Now a Celery worker is, is calling it a process is maybe not quite correct. It's more of an instance. It will have multiple processes and each process will have multiple threads. It's configurable so you can pretty much configure as many processes and threads as you need and your system can handle. Uh, it's also possible to use an alternative um, processing scheme which uses either eventlet or gevent. But obviously, since those um, do non-blocking I.O., if you choose to use that pool for a particular worker, you have to write your tasks in a slightly different fashion just to take into account you know, that the I.O. is going to be non-blocking. So additionally, you can also deploy exactly one beat instance. Um, you could deploy more than one beat instance, but it would be a very bad idea. Um, so Celery Beat basically is a, in essence, it's actually a Celery application itself, which runs tasks in a scheduled fashion. So it allows you to replace cron, essentially, except in a distributed way, which is quite useful. And finally, a very optional 
but pretty recommended component, which is not technically like a first party piece of the Celery project, is something called Flower. It's basically a web interface for managing your um, running Celery cluster uh, per se. It gives you some insight into what's happening um, in Celery as it's running. Um, obviously, there's some limitations as to what it can do, um, but it's generally giving you a lot more information than you'd have if you were just going, okay, I have some processes running, what's going on? So beyond the basic stuff that you expect, you know, tasks which can run asynchronously, Celery's got quite a rich workflow system. So the workflow system in Celery consists of, at the base level, signatures, which basically allow you to serialize task invocations. So you can capture an invocation of a specific task. You can then use that invocation um, almost like in a partially applied fashion. You can actually pass that signature to other tasks so that you can essentially pass around asynchronous invocations between asynchronous invocations. So that's pretty useful if you know you're trying to put together more complex flows of logic and so forth. Callbacks build onto this. They allow you to say, okay, I have a task. If it's successful, call this with its result. Then we have chains, which are like callbacks, but many. <laughs> and obviously the, the idea there is that if you were, the way you tend to use callbacks is you actually are calling, you know, you're saying task.delay with a specific parameter called callback. So obviously if you just use the basic callback mechanism, you'd end up nesting and nesting and nesting and nesting and nesting. And no one wants to do that. So obviously they decided chains were a good idea. Beyond that, we've got groups, which basically allow you to um, do parallel processing, so execute a bunch of tasks in parallel and then get the result back. Um, beyond that, you have chords, which is a very fancy name for groups with callbacks. I'm not sure why they decided to give it a fancy name, but hey, you know, it's more interesting than groups with callbacks. Map um, obviously works the way you'd expect it to, you know, apply a task to an iterable. And then chunks allows you to actually break up an iterable into, you know, well, chunks, which you're going to apply, um, you know, in groups. So obviously all of these, um, well, they call them primitives, are also signatures. So you can mix and match them quite flexibly. There's a lot of options as to how you build your, your flow of, like, tasks and so forth in a Celery application. Um, it's, it's very flexible for, you know, just doing stuff. <laughs> Right, so another useful feature of Celery, um, it's very easy to customize the routing of um, tasks to workers. And this is actually very useful and extremely important because you can set up a cluster with multiple workers and configure it so that certain workers only feed off certain task queues and other workers service task queues in general. And so this actually allows you to build some resiliency into your system so that, say, you have a task queue which is servicing, sending SMSs, and another one which is sending emails. Some kind of failure in the SMS side of things which you haven't you know, accounted for or haven't been able to test in the real world won't cause your email sending to suddenly fall over because this, the, you know, this, the SMS side of things has like, exploded. Um, Right, it also provides a signal system. Um, for anyone who's used Django, it's pretty familiar. You basically just start hooking into sort of events and so forth associated with the Celery application lifecycle. I guess the main difference is, is that depending on the signal that you use, where it's executed will vary. Uh, certain signals are obviously triggered inside worker instances. Other signals are triggered inside your um, you know, the code which is triggering your application, so maybe in your synchronous code. Uh, other signals are tied to maybe startups of worker processes, and since you can configure Celery to you know shut down and restart workers, that you know will actually not necessarily just get triggered once, but multiple times. And yeah, on the subject of Django, it's got Django integration, um, which it's actually pretty basic. Really, it just means that it's 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 piggybacking its settings off your Django settings file. There's not really that much more to it, um, but there doesn't really need to be. Um, because the way that Celery works in a synchronous application is quite simple. So yeah, there's a lot to recommend Celery. I mean, it's a mature project. Um, the first proper version was released in 2009. Um, version 4 is due like sometime soon. They've got release candidates out now, um, yeah, which is looking good. And obviously the fact that they're scaling back their broker support is probably a good thing because previously it was this 
giant mess of, okay, we support messaging queue systems like RabbitMQ. We've got stuff like Redis, which isn't uh, AMQP, but provides some similar features. And then we've got a whole bunch of other things like a SQL Alchemy backend, a Django ORM backend, various things which don't support a lot of the, the functionality that AMQP provides, but you can kind of use them, <laughs> but certain things won't work. So in that case, I guess they're unifying the system a lot more. So yeah, uh, Celery is very configurable. Um, if you go and check the documentation, there is a huge um, <coughs> degree of control that you have over configuring your Celery application at both the application level, the worker level, and the task level. You can configure rate limits, time limits on tasks. You can apply those settings to a worker as a whole. You can apply them at the application level. There's a lot of flexibility. Caveat there is that some of those settings are carrier not recommended unless you really need it. Um, Provisio, like uh, well, rate limiting, uh, their own words are it introduces a lot of complexity in terms of what's executing under the hood. So if you don't need it, don't use it. Uh, Celery is pretty easy to scale. Um, since you're just, you know, it's, you can configure the number of processes, the number of threads per process, it's very easy to scale it vertically in a single machine. And because it uses a third-party broker system, if you want to scale horizontally, it's really just a matter of deploying a new worker instance on a new machine and, hook and pointing it at the same broker, and it does the rest. Uh, everything works pretty well. The only real trick there is obviously if your broker starts to s experience some load, you might need to cluster that. And as, as well, anyone who's tried to cluster RabbitMQ can tell you that can be a little bit tricky. <laughs> And then, of course, we have Celery Beat. As I mentioned before, it's kind of uh, a bit like Cron, except it's distributed and asynchronous. And I really like Beat. Um, it's, a, it's much preferable being able to version control your scheduled tasks and have them executing across multiple machines as compared to trying to manage contab files, their contents, making sure that if you do have multiple Celery workers, that you know, everything is you know, correct, that there's no contabs which are misconfigured and so forth. Finally, documentation. Um, it's got really good documentation, and it's, it's kind of sad that in 2016 that's still a selling point for software, but I mean, there you have it. Writing good documentation is hard. Celery has good documentation. It, it's pretty exhaustive. It covers a lot. Generally, you're not going to need to go diving into the Celery source code, which you should be very happy for, because you don't want to. <laughs> So now we get to the bad parts. Uh, as with most vegetables, celery is not all leafy and green. Um, because it's highly configurable, that obviously has the flip side of it's highly configurable. So you can sit there tinkering with settings until the cows come home. You can also create configurations which may not behave in the way you expect. For example, you can configure an, uh, an exchange. So if you're not aware, Essentially, the usual setup is you have an exchange, at, which is on the broker, and each exchange manages multiple queues. Now, normally, you're going to configure your exchange to function in a direct fashion, but you can also configure an exchange to function in a topic fashion, and that has the very interesting effect of when you, when you post a message, well, when you execute a task, some workers that you think shouldn't be executing that task may end up executing it because you haven't given the correct configuration details to the workers. So then you've got yourself some duplication of task execution that you weren't expecting. So you have to be very careful and obviously test your configuration thoroughly. It's also prone to a lot of peculiar issues. Now, at one point I thought this was just us and we were doing something terribly, terribly wrong with Celery, but a quick visit to Google and an even longer visit to GitHub and their issue tracker and a lot of Googling and so forth on various issues. It's not just us. So a couple of interesting ones you've seen. Um, if you're using the Django ORM in a Siri worker and you don't restart that worker for a long time, Django just magically starts returning empty result sets. It's probably some kind of memory leak, but good luck diagnosing it. The easiest thing to do is just restart the worker. But it's one of those things where you're like, this is, yeah, I'm not really comfortable with this happening ever. Even if I can get around it, I'd like to know why. <laughs> um, and the larger body of issues which you'll encounter, um, there's a lot of issues related to brokers. So um, some of them are not quite 
specific to brokers. So, for example, if you're using um, AW, if you're deploying to AWS, and you're using an Elastic Load Balancer, you may discover that Elastic, the Elastic Load Balancer decides to just close AMQP connections between RabbitMQ and Celery, which it thinks are inactive, and this causes all kinds of havoc. It's yeah, it's not pretty. You can, and essentially, in order to fix it, you essentially have to disable um, a connection pool in Celery. But obviously, connection pooling is often something you want to use, so it's not a great trade-off there. So staying in the realm of MQP, um, Rabbit tends to have this default behavior of unact messages being re-enqueued. So the usual behavior is Celery, a worker is going to retrieve messages from the broker, and then it's going to acknowledge those, retrieve the messages, and then execute them. But every now and then you're going to encounter this behavior, which well, we've encountered it, where that workflow doesn't seem to happen because you end up with unacknowledged messages in your RabbitMQ. And then that can result in, like, the unac messages will either end up being re-enqueued at some point, which can actually cause duplication if the task did execute correctly, and yet somehow was not acknowledged correctly. It can also cause a stall in your entire task execution pipeline, where if, if you end up with unacknowledged messages which are essentially broken because whatever they're trying to do is, like, breaking every time it runs, then you can literally just end up with a queue which just sits there and doesn't empty. And then you have the choice, okay, do I just like purge this queue of every task in it and hope that there's nothing critical in there? Um, or do you, you know, <laughs> try and do something else? So that's where splitting your queues up so that that kind of thing doesn't cause problems is helpful. Finally, um, oh well, I suppose I should also mention we well we don't use Redis with RabbitMQ, um, but if you take a look at the GitHub issue tracker, you'll see that plenty of people who use Redis have also run into issues. Some of them are related to out of memory and so forth, which is kind of scary. And I guess one thing which. Yeah, that the fact for me that recently they closed a lot of these issues related to brokers with a message which is very similar to, let's hope this is magically fixed in 4.x. For me, that's like, guys, that's not cool. <laughs> that's not cool. I mean, this is a project which people are using. You know, you don't just close issues which people have reported which you can't replicate with a line like, let's just hope it get magically fixes itself. Yeah, not cool. Um, finally, debugging. So, as everyone knows, debugging multi-threaded applications is usually painful. Debugging multi-process applications is also painful. Debugging multi-threaded, multi-process applications distributed over multiple machines is also even more painful. Not much to really add beyond what a lot of people probably already know. You're going to have to rely on a lot on logging and a lot of unit testing uh, to just try and pick up problems before they ever happen because the usual kind of debugging tricks that you use on, on a Python application, you're not really going to apply in a, in a cell running Celery instance to try and pick up and live debug things. Cool. So that's um, Celery. Let's move on to Crossbar. So Crossbar is a WAMP router. Now, you probably just heard me say WAMP, and you're thinking Windows, Apache, MySQL, PHP, what's going on? Nope, nope, nope. If, uh, if you've got some PHP PTSD, maybe you've got like a twitching eyelid about now. Don't worry, don't worry, it's cool. It's not that kind of WAMP. Um, it's an open standard for pub, sub, and, op and routed RPC messaging over WebSockets. Stands for Web Application Messaging Protocol. It's pretty new. WebSockets, which it's built on, is also relatively new, but less new than WAMP. Um, and that is obviously a really nice little thing which provides full duplex communications over a single TCP connection. So originally built with web servers and clients in mind, but it's actually applicable to pretty much any kind of server and client. So the WAMP standard defines roles for routers and clients. Crossbar is basically the reference implementation for a WAMP router. Um, it's implemented by a company called Tavendo. They're based in Europe. Um, they're actually the leading group behind the WAMP standard, but not the only people involved. They also have a client implementation called Autobahn, which allows you to um, write WAMP components. The implementation supports Python 2 and 3, JavaScript and Android, although the Android version is a little bit out of date currently. I believe they're working on improving that. 
I find it a bit strange that there's an Android version, but not, uh, but it's not a Java version. So they've they've had to make a decision targeting there. <coughs> so yeah, as with any good standard, there are multiple parties involved. So there are actually multiple client and router implementations, which is generally a good sign with anything of that sort. You know, if you have an open standard and there's just one like you know implementer, well, okay. So Crossbar provides some pretty cool stuff. Um, a single crossbar instance can serve as hundreds of thousands of concurrent connections, tens of thousands of concurrent messages. In this regard, it's quite similar to other um, asynchronous non-blocking systems like Node.js, Tornado, Netty, and so forth. It's a, very, it's a similar kind of idea. WAM components are pretty flexible. Um, they're actually quite location agnostic. Any component can either publish or subscribe to a topic can um, expose a, a, a function for RPC or call another function for RPC. So with, WAMP, with the WAMP system, there's really not a strong division between server and client unless you choose to implement one yourself. It's actually quite cool. So in terms of deploying components, Crossbar specifically provides some extra features. So you know, obviously, if you have WAM components, you can run them anywhere and connect them to a router, and that's cool. Crossbar provides you some additional features for deploying components in the same general location as Crossbar is running. You can actually deploy components in the same process space as Crossbar, um, which is pretty. Which the proviso there is, it has to be pretty much Python 2, since Crossbar is implemented in Python 2 using Twisted. Um, you can actually deploy them in guest processes, so that allows you to deploy Python 3 um, co components um, along with Python 2 running Twisted. You can also deploy um, components written in completely different languages, and that also essentially is a, a guest process system. Um, yeah, so in terms of security, Crossbar actually provides this, um, whereas, say, Celery doesn't, because it's not a concern for them at all, really. Um, obviously, uh, they kind of have to, because your, the way WAMP is, is designed, you can actually distribute your components very widely. Technically, you can have components running in, in a user's web browser. And so, obviously, in that kind of scenario, you need a security system. They provide a means of implementing authentication and another means of implementing authorization. Um, so obviously authentication is, you know, am I allowed to connect and authorization is, am I allowed to do this? Uh, the nice thing with the authentication and authorization stuff is that every authenticator and authorizer is also itself a WAMP component. So there's like internal consistency there. Obviously the trick there is that you, you might need to run your authenticator and authorization components a bit closer to the WAMP router than other components since they, they generally need like uh, elevated privileges in the system. Um, a nice feature with uh, the RPC functionality provided by Crossbar is that you can do shared registrations of RPC functions. So multiple components can register that they provide the same RPC function. So if you want to scale up an RPC function, you can literally just like bring online more components. They'll connect to the router and say, hey, I'm here. I can handle this function. Send stuff my way. And that's, that's pretty cool because, I mean, the possibilities for that, given that you can run components in people's web browsers, are pretty cool. You know, you could, like, distribute load among everyone using your system. You may not want to. It may be considered bad behavior. But, you know, if you do things right, it's not necessarily going to be the case. As I mentioned before, um, WAMP is an open standard with multiple implementations. This means it's very polyglot friendly. There are a lot of different WAMP client and router implementations. So besides Python and JavaScript, you can also write WAMP components in C, Objective-C, C++, Java, C Sharp, Go, Haskell, Erlang, Ruby, Lua, and even PHP. <laughs> I'm not sure why you choose to use the last one, but maybe you know you don't have a choice. Anyway, the nice thing about that is that you've got a lot of flexibility there. You know, if you need access to a specific uh, library which a specific language provides and you need to encapsulate it as a microservice, Crossbar is great for that because, you know, you just write it in the language that it's good at. If you need performance from something, well, use C or C++, so on. For, developer, for development purposes, Crossbar provides an embedded HTTP server. Um, I don't think that people tend to use that in a production context, but I guess it's useful if you're writing a really... 
like minimal kind of HTML5 type web application where the HTML is basically just a skeleton and everything else gets loaded asynchronously and happens asynchronously. And you might use it in that scenario, but I think generally in production, you're not going to use that. So, yeah, uh, it does suffer from a few problems. I think the biggest problem with Crossbar is that it's written and twisted. So you're generally going to be, especially if you're writing like Python 2 code, but I guess even with a Python 3 code, Twisted is a non-blocking asynchronous framework. And a lot of the existing libraries and tools in Python are not non-blocking asynchronous. They're synchronous, they're blocking. So you need to be careful when using those in conjunction um, with Crossbar. So, I mean, you can, you can alleviate it by running um, your synchronous code in separate processes entirely, caching using an asynchronous system like TX Redis API and so forth. But generally, you just need to be careful. Um, and try and use the twisted ecosystem alternatives. But sometimes this is just, it's going to limit your choices. Because, I mean, if we look at like ORMs, there are multiple synchronous blocking ORMs. There's maybe one async. There's, I think it's TwiStar or something like that. Uh, so if you want to use TwiStar, you can. It's not going to give you all the features of SQL Alchemy, but, you know, that's, you don't really have a choice. The other big thing for a lot of people is going to be that there's no clustering support yet. So I suspect this is maybe because it doesn't use a third-party broker for handling the messaging that, uh, that is underlying the whole system. But currently, there's no support for clustering. Uh, it's being worked on. It's in active work, I believe. It's also overdue, unfortunately. And maybe more unfortunately, it's going to be part of a commercial offering from Tavendo. So, mm, but hey, I mean, they have to make money somehow, right? <laughs> Um, the final point would have been a big one previously. So when I submitted this, the concept for this talk, the documentation on their site was very out of date. It didn't cover a lot of the features in the current release of Crossbar, and it was just painful. They, since, since the talk was submitted, and I don't know, maybe like two, three weeks ago, when I took another look at the documentation, they've magically, it's like been updated a significant amount. It, greatly reflects the actual current state of what you can do a lot better. With that said, you're still going to need to look at the example code repositories because there's stuff which they still don't cover. And the easiest way to, to you know, deal with that is just look at examples. So yeah, um, that's Celery and that's Crossbar. So I guess, I mean, the, the topic of this talk has been Celery versus Crossbar. So I guess, you know, we want to decide which one to use and when. Well, I mean, it's tricky. Um, I would say Celery, obviously, if your work really can be broken down into tasks, which you want to execute asynchronously, or maybe especially have a strong need to ex execute in a scheduled fashion, then Celery is a good choice. It really fits the model of you know, what their system is about. I mean, it is a distributed task queue, after all. If you need a clear path for scaling horizontally and vertically, then Celery is obviously like a better pick because there's, it's very clear what you can do there, whereas with Crossbar, it's still up in the air as to how you're going to scale horizontally. I've had some ideas that maybe you could, you know, have multiple Crossbar routers running and, and proxy between them using a component, but, you know, that's obviously not, that's just an idea. Whether or not it would actually work is anyone's guess. Um, yeah, and obviously if you need the workflows provided by Siri, then it's a good pick. Crossbar, uh, if you want to get into the, the do like do some programming with the whole asynchronous non-blocking paradigm, it's a really good choice. Uh, it provides, I mean, WebSockets and Python, that's great. Uh, previously, when I last looked at doing WebSockets in Python, your option was to rig up some kind of awful nightmare contraption using uWSGI. And that was, it was scary. <laughs> it was, was not, a, not a pleasant um, thing to look at. Also, if you, you need something which is going to use authentication authorization um, of your distributed kind of tasks, then Crossbar is a good choice. Celery's thing is they, they write their stuff to be secure, but ultimately it comes down to the messaging broker that you're using. If that's secure, you know, cool. But if it's not too bad, it's not really their problem. And finally, if you want to use WAMP and, you know, and also WebSockets as well, because although WAMP is, is built on WebSockets, it doesn't supersede it. So if you need to drop down beneath WAMP and use standard WebSockets, you're still allowed to. 
uh, well, allowed to, capable of doing so. Yeah, I don't think anyone's going to like, you know, physically restrain you if you try. So, yeah, different projects actually in different spaces. Is it really fair to compare them? Eh, probably not, but, you know, anyway, we wouldn't have a talk if I decided not to. Um, it's also quite possible to use Celery and Crossbar together. There's nothing to stop you from getting them to talk to each other and playing to their strengths. Um, you can easily, you know, use, like, pull stuff off a RabbitMQ queue from a Celery um, component. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. With all that said, um, I think for me Crossbar is the more exciting project of the two. Maybe maybe because I haven't had any any uh, like hair loss issues as with Celery yet, but you know that may change with actually deploying it um, in production. Who knows? Um, but also just the whole WAMP web sockets thing for me in the web development space is really exciting because uh, it really flips the whole you know pull thing on its head, allows you to do a lot of really interesting stuff. Yeah, so. Now that's it. Um, thanks for listening. Hopefully it wasn't too dull. <laughs> and if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Um. Uh, hello. Uh, thanks very much. That was that was really great. Uh, any questions? I hit the time limit. <laughs> yeah, just on the dot. Yeah. Eh? So we've only got about f four or five minutes for questions because we're running a little behind. So if anyone has anything to ask. I, I, um, okay, so I'm probably doing something pretty bad, so don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to <laughs> find uh, out the implications. So I've got a system uh, that I have on Elastic Beanstalk, uh, which scales, and I'm running the Celery workers together with the Django um, application in there, just for the fact that it's not so big that I can justify running another cluster just for the workers. Uh -huh. So I'm running them in the same process. Mm -hmm. But now, because it's the same machine, I've got Celery Beat. When it scales, Celery Beat is running on three machines at the same time. How, what are the ramifications of that? Well, that's going to that's gonna duplicate. That would be like having... That would basically be like having the cron daemon running multiple times on a single machine. Your task is going to get every... If you have a task scheduled to execute every minute, it's going to execute three times every minute because oh. you've scaled it up three times. Oh, okay. So you really want to... Uh, even somehow you want to run Celery Beat once or zero times. It's a zero to one kind of thing. Okay. I, I'm for, for that, I'm like uh, I'm using caching because all the machines use the same Redis mm. cache server. So I'm using uh, caching to lock the task. So if a task starts up, it checks the keys to see if it was yeah, already done. Yeah, you know, I did that once in the past. I would recommend that you that you run away from that very quickly. It's not good. It's I know I know Redis can be used as a distributed locking system, but you probably shouldn't be doing so. Because you know, like I mean, as we all know from multi-threaded programming. You know, locking and stuff is great, but you're going to get problems. Distributed locking is just the same problem, but more. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But that's my, my experience. I'm sure there's some people out there who've had, like, no problems with distributed locks, but I would think that you're asking for trouble in the long run using them. They're just complexity. And, you know, any time you increase the complexity of a system, it's going to get more unstable and more liable to fail in weird ways that you weren't expecting. So try and prefer the simplest solution to a problem. So in the case of your situation, just run one beat instance somehow. Cool. Much simpler than, than distributed locking. Last, last question. Over there. So um, I played a salary a while ago just for fun. And at that stage, I found it quite hard to have something to happen in response to a task finishing because you'd have to use callbacks and mm. you, you, know, you end up in callback hell. So does it have I extended it in the meantime to support kind of any of the async or you know those kind of coroutine type approaches to that? Uh, not really as far as I'm aware. I mean essentially when you execute a task in Celery you get back a re an object which represents an asynchronous result. But obviously if you're running that in that object is maybe it's probably going to be in synchronous code unless you know obviously you can distribute it you can execute Celery tasks from other Celery tasks and in that case you're probably not going to worry so much about saying wait until this result object has actually got stuff in it. But in blocking code, obviously that's not really, th in like synchronous code, that's not something you want to do. So I think the general thing there is, you know, oh, oh, well the way I've approached it is just, I don't care about the results of what I'm sending to Celery. It's stuff where it's literally, I want this to go into the Celery worker pool 
and what happens in the salary stays in salary. I'm not expecting to get anything back from it, which I wouldn't be able to just you know say okay, eventually like does so it, this will result in a change in my database, and that will obviously that will become obvious when someone maybe queries a certain page. It'll be obvious that that change has finally happened. So yeah, in my case, I just don't don't worry about <laughs> salary result objects at all. Prefer to avoid them. It's not like uh, like uh, obviously if you're using a some languages provide like a like once well Python three has the concept of a future as well, and a lot of uh, like uh, statically statically type languages that you do some really nice stuff with futures like Scala lets you do cool stuff with futures, but in with Celery and so forth, it's your options are a lot more limited as to what you can achieve without writing really hairy code. Cool. Uh, thanks, Adam. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, come find him afterwards if you have more questions. I know that was a bit short. Uh, the reason it's a bit short is because the next talk will start in about five minutes. Well, cool. it's <laughs> twice as long as when I practiced it at home. <laughs> so I talked a bit slower, obviously. That always happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh.